Um, just to come back to the original point, I really do massively appreciate what you've done to come here and say this and what you've been through. Um, but to come back to, the, so do you feel that the Geneva Convention was respected or was not respected by by, by the troops out there in, in operations? Well, like I said, I'm not a lawyer. No. Um, I, and, but I would say that it wasn't respected at all. Um, you know, like I said before, once we became the occupied power, we had legal obligations um, to protect the people of Iraq. And we did the opposite. Do you think that if you um, have been better briefed on what the uh, laws of war were, that you as an individual would have felt more responsible and acted in a different way? Or do you feel as though you were acting under the authority of someone else and regardless of what you felt you should do you know, to carry out orders? Right, so that's the question is, um, as is as it okay to follow orders? Is it? I, I suppose what I'm saying is, um, is if you had been briefed in more, um, in more depth about the, the laws of war, you would perhaps have known the boundaries and known when you were crossing them. Um, so do you think that if you had known those boundaries better, you yourself would have felt that you could stop at certain levels? Or do you think that regardless of that, you would always have to follow order? Better training or briefing in the law yeah. to know where you stood, I think. Oh. Yeah, I suppose um, that's a hard question to answer because there's so many different, when you're in the army, there's so many different um, pressures on you from, you know, different pressures and obviously they all have a certain amount of effects on you and it's hard to know if you increase one, you know, what the effect would be, you know. Uh, I think that there should be a better briefing. In all, I suppose in a way, um, if, if you were told to do something, um, you would assume that it was legal, it was correct. Um, the, the thing with the British Army is, is, is that is what happens is that, um, like for example, you're given the rules of engagement. And that is that you should only have used deadly force in, in response to deadly force. You know, in a nutshell, it's, it's longer than that. And um, say you were to go into someone's house and um, and you shot them and so that they didn't even, there was no weapons in the house, they weren't they weren't about to use deadly force against you. You as an individual would be prosecuted. And that point has always been handed home to British soldiers throughout the time in Northern Ireland. You, you know that, that that you have individual responsibility. For, for your own actions. So you have got individual responsibility for your own actions. But it goes back to this compartmentalisation of roles. So if my job is to blow the hole in the wall, okay, so we're sneaking up to the house in the middle of the night, I put the explosives on the wall and I blow it off, then the guy's going, well, have I done something illegal? Okay, I've blown a hole in the wall, but we're artists, we've been told that you know, this guy, I've had his eyes inside this house. Is that reasonable use of force to, um, if we knocked on the door, we might have been shot at, you know? So by breaking things down into small parts, you know, we then handed the people over, we weren't part of the interrogations. And I think that's how, that's how cr um, crime on a big level is carried out. The state asks you to carry out a small part of it. And, and we all, we all carry out a small part of it. Even the people sat at home, play a small part in this, you know, through their silence, through their non-action or whatever, so... Taxes. Through their taxes, you know, we pay for that explosives that we use. So, so I think that, that's the point, is that, is that when you make your role in it so small, it's hard to see um, bigger picture. the bigger picture of what you're actually part of. So you, uh, just... so, so, sorry, you, um, your service in the army was how many years? Eight years. Years and of that eight years, you spent what four months in Iraq? Yeah, three months. Yeah. Three months in Iraq. Uh, didn't your previous service career sort of guide you towards acting differently when you were in Iraq? Because you said you've been on tour in Northern Ireland. Yeah. So things that you said yourself weren't acceptable in Northern Ireland, you were finding yourself doing in Iraq. Didn't that in itself pose you questions? Well, it did, and that's why I refused to continue serving in Iraq. After, after three months, yeah. Um, the thing about Iraq as well, 
And I'm not trying to defend Northern Ireland, Yugoslavia, and Afghanistan. That's not the point I'm trying to make. But Iraq was so much different to those previous um, operations that I've been involved in. Um, there, there really was a sense in Baghdad when I was there of almost gold rush fever. There were private security firms all over Baghdad. They, they obviously had been given a lot of money. They had a lot of uh, expensive vehicles, expensive weapons, expensive everything, you know. And, um, <coughs> yeah, Iraq really was something quite different from my previous service in that the feel of the place, you know, like what we were there for, you know, you really got the impression that we were there so to... what were you there for? Because, I mean, so you made a point of, like, deep and yet you said that the US um, troops or some of the US soldiers, you know, somehow acted potentially uh, as a revenge uh, from 9-11. So they seem to be driven somehow by an ideology. An ideology. Was there an ideology in the British Army? I mean, were you briefed on the bigger picture of why it was important for the British Army to be in Iraq? The, the main motivation with it, I certainly passed the passion of the special air service what was called volunteer units, even though the British Army is voluntary, you had to volunteer to join these unit. And what um, what drives the men and those units on is esprit de corps. Um, it's about um, you know being the best and doing your job very professionally with professional soldiers. And um, whereas say the uh, and not all of them some a portion of American troops are driven by ideology. You know, a lot of people joined the American forces after 9-11, you know, they felt that it was the right thing to do to get some, you know, to get some sort of favour. There wasn't that, there's never, never wasn't that feeling in the British Army. It's more of a, it's more of a pragmatic army. Um, so, you know, if we were told, or it's our turn to go to Iraq, that's just what we do, we go to Iraq, we do what, do what we've been asked to do, and, Move on to the next job, you know. So no, no idea why Iraq in particular is just there to perform the job we could be doing it anyway, not really question. I don't think the politicians at that point knew why we were Iraq. I don't I mean I, don't I know, think... but it would be interesting to see like actually from a soldier's perspective, uh, what kind of information was relayed to the troops, you know, as to why they were there. Because you said there was this sense of superiority in a way, so, you know. So as a soldier, you're already kind of uh, holding civilians necessarily, not necessarily you, but civilians as inferior citizens of this planet, and to use big terms. But there must be some sort of, I don't know, some sort of thought behind that, no? The reason that they've got up, I mean, one of the main reasons that they gave to the other was weapons of mass destruction, the Americans were sold in some 9 11 link, but. Sense of but why? It'd be nice to hear the soldier actually. Yeah. But, you know, but, were you given any briefing as to you know as to why the, the political context in which the UK was at the time? Maybe not. I'm not. You know, I'm not seeking. I can't. Re I can't remember being given a briefing <laughs> why why we were there. Um, and the British Army is a is a very small army in comparison. And it's all it's almost got like a it's almost like a cult. You know, like when you're inside the British Army, everyone, including British citizens, British civilians, are seen as outsiders. And it's all about what happens within that unit and relationships within that unit and how that unit performs. And the external world is is outside of that. It's it's very tight, very close. And what really matters is how that unit performs. How you perform within that unit, um, rather than. <coughs> so when you when you interacted with your with your colleagues and um, near the end of the three months, um, you had calls to have conversations with them. What were their opinions? Um, there was a, a vast range of opinion, you know, from people who saw themselves as just professional soldiers, like just do as I'm told. To people like myself who thought this is wrong, I'm not, I'm not going to be part of this anymore, and everything in between, and the doubts. Um, 
a senior officer came out to brief us once and said that he was worried that we were becoming, becoming a secret police of Baghdad. So it wasn't just, it, there were all these doubts and all these <coughs> sort of um, different ideas about why we were there and what every individual person would have had their own motivation for why they continued to be there, why they were in the army. You know? And you personally, when you started to mention your, uh, your thoughts about what was happening, how did your colleagues respond to you? Did they ostracise you? No, I mean, I was sent home on um, a week's leave in late March and um, decided to go and have an interview with my commanding officer when I, when I was back in Caribbean and um, told him that I wasn't going to continue serving in Iraq or continue serving under American command. Um, I, was I was actually treated very well. Um, no one... Um, they might not agree with me, but no one, really, no one sort of tried to change my mind, except for the uh, hard drive and chapter, who was the only one who tried to make me go back. <laughs> yes, uh, well, that's, uh, that's interesting. <laughs> Why? Uh, he didn't say why, well, but I, I often thought about it afterwards, and I think that the, the role of a chaplain in the army is not to um, not to dish out the message of Christ, but to sort of use any religious feelings that someone might have to get them to continue doing what the army wants. Yeah. So, what have you done since you've come back? Are you still serving in the army, or what's your No, I left the army in 2005. Okay. Um, after I refused to serve the right I was basically discharged from the army. Um, I've been active in a sort of um, anti-war peace movement. Uh, in 2008, I was taken to the High Court in uh, Strand and given a lifetime injunction. Um, as a result, it prevents me from taking anything I know as a result of my service. Um, and I'm now still active in an organisation called Veterans for Peace. Um, just like to uh, sort of sum up something, uh, we're going to wind up this stage, but I think maybe the, uh, the other part of the council might say something that. Um, but basically, just uh, myself more than any other person in this room, maybe, can appreciate more of what you've gone through. My dad went from a private to a major in the Marines, so I grew up in barracks. I was really into special wars, so I really appreciate what you have gone through and what you, in a small way, I appreciate that and what you've come to say to us today. And uh, my dad passed away just before the second round of the Iraq War. And he, for a man who served 40 years in the services, blew me away. Before he died, he said, this next round of the Iraq War is unnecessary for a man who fought for 40 years in, you know, on five different continents. Uh, this war is unnecessary. This war is about oil. And it's unnecessary because we could be using water engines. And for a 73-year-old man to say that to me, it blew me away. We haven't always seen eye to eye. So, uh, ben Griffin, I have maximum respect for you. <laughs> all the way for all of that to come here to say that. Maximum respect. Thank you and you know, love and support to all of everything and all you do. Well done. I think maybe the other side of the one. Thanks very so much, Ben. Uh, we may call you later on if, if you're around. If that's James. possible. James. Well, we need to. I think we have here a good week. Balance on. All right. Can we build a balance on Okay, yeah, um, ben, um, I know you said you just introduce yourself. So I'm James, I'm acting for the defence acting. Um, ben, I know you said you, you eventually left the army and refused to go back to Iraq, but during the evidence that you've given today about uh, some of the operations that you were on, at any point did you refuse to follow an order or question an order? Yeah, on one night um, we uh, got into a, a small group of buildings, on, I can't remember where it was, but it was outside of Baghdad in, in the countryside somewhere. And um, we got in, the guy, the guy and his family were there on their own, and um, quite a few of our guys are very good Arabists, so they can converse quite freely. And um, they questioned this guy, and it turned out that he fled Fallujah because of the fighting, and all he wanted was a quiet time. And everything added up, you know, his story added up. Um, the Iraqi guy who was with us said, yeah, he's not lying, you know, um, all his papers added up. So we got the radio <coughs> and told our commander, we're not bringing this guy in, he's, we don't, we don't think he's a threat, we, don't, we, we think it's a case of mistake, identity or whatever, the wrong address. And they said, no, bring him in. And we said, no, not bring him in. So we went back and um, our boss got 
taking the stage superior, he was doing a big bollocking, and then the next night, another unit, like our sister unit, was sent back in to get the same guy. And uh, just a final question. Um, I know the panel been talking about uh, knowing the law, they have lawyers in the army and the college, but do you not think um, soldiers in uh, situations think too much about the law and not actually would actually cause a hesitation and actually be more dangerous in their lives? Well, I, I think that it's only human that you're always going to think about your own safety first anyway. So, um, I don't think that would ever be a problem. Your, your main um, thought is always about you're looking for lethal, lethal threats and you're always going to neutralise those lethal threats and it, the way you're trained is so embedded into your brain that even when you've left the army it's quite hard to stop doing that so that sort of instinctual, um, instinctual way of, of defending yourself and defending those around you that, that's not going to be affected by this because it's so deeply ingrained if soldiers were um, more sort of aware of their legal obligations, then um, during the process of, um, like an orders process, when you're being briefed on an operation, maybe more questions would be asked about whether this was, you know, in compliance with the Geneva Convention. Um, but like I said before, the, the lawyers, in my experience, the lawyers in the army were there to try and circumnavigate this, to try and avoid this. Um, so, it's all very well the soldiers being briefed on this, um, but w when you've got the bigger organisation trying to avoid getting entangled in this, I'm not sure how that would work. Okay, yeah. and, um, okay. okay. I think we've taken a ten-minute break now, and uh, we'll restart in ten minutes' time. Thanks very much.